Okay, good morning, everyone. So, in the continuation of our lecture series six, today I think I'm really happy that uh, that first time Gangaram Hospital, Sir Gangaram Hospital, is joining us uh, as a uh, speaker from Gangaram Hospital. And uh, the best part is she is the first DNB student from Gangaram Hospital. Uh, so, before I introduce Mithilesh, and Mithilesh will introduce Pratibha. Uh, I just want to say one thing that uh, in the process of starting uh, DNB and MDs in uh, in the hospitals and uh, uh, metro hospitals and corporate hospitals, uh, I think the least uh, least uh, efforts I have put is in Gangaram Hospital. Uh, I know uh, that the head of the Gangaram Hospital, Doctor. Um, Jashri Sood, as soon as she, uh, with Dr. Bimla, as soon as Dr. Bimla approached her and uh, we talked to each other, uh, one, within a day, they have submitted the DNB application and then I think they were the first one to get DNB palliative medicine. And the way they have started and they have, the best part, again, one more best part is they have appointed our first MD palliative medicine student as a consultant. So there is no doubt that they will grow, they will shine, and they will achieve like anything. Uh, because everybody has attitude, everybody wants to work. And in a corporate hospital, if it will flourish, I think it will flourish all over India. And when it will flourish all over India, I think all patients will get benefited. So I'm so happy to introduce this. I know this is not Mithilesh introduction, but I'm just introducing because there are so many um, audience they have joined today. And it is new for this institution is new for them. So regarding Mithilesh, Mithilesh is a very good friend of ours. And we know Mithilesh since last many, many years. We know uh, we used to meet in all pain conferences because he has got a keen interest in pain management. And automatically those who have keen interest in pain management, they are integrating palliative care. And thus he is one of a teacher of palliative medicine uh, for DNB students in Gangaram Hospital. You can see his uh, CV. He has done a lot of work in pain management. He has did fellowship in India from Indian Academy of Pain, fellowship from International Pain Management and Palliative Care. He has also done the basic course. And I think the, during the basic course, I realized that he has got, when the, both of them uh, came and when they participated in our CTC program, I think I realized that they, there is a lot of potential in this hospital and in these people, and they really want to develop and see that how growth has happened over here. So uh, I'm really happy, uh, Mithlesh, that you have joined today. And Pratibha is our first TNB student from Gangaram Hospital is speaking on cancer pain syndrome, which is a very, very important topics for PG. This is just a background, Mithlesh, and they just want to say that this is a class, these classes are for PGs, is to PG students and the youngsters, those who are practicing palliative care, and it's going on since last, um, almost in, during the COVID we have started, so almost three, four years, and this is sixth series going on. I, I have seen, Mithlesh, you are joining all the time. Go ahead, Mithlesh. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you so much, ma'am, for... Uh, uh... Uh, introduction and telling so good things about our institute. You are always a mentor. We have whatever we have learned in palliative care, it is because of you and from you. I have been to your institute so many times and I will continue learning from you, ma'am. Uh, regarding this lecture, it's a, a very common and very important topic. Our bright student, uh, Dr. Pratibha, she is uh, uh, our DNB, a palliative medicine. Uh, very keen interest in teaching our staff. She is like, uh, she even post duty after night duty, she is really dedicated to palliative care. I'm so happy that uh, she is going to uh, uh, talk about a topic which is so close to uh, my heart and uh, we'll see uh, how well she has prepared. And I want everybody to utilize this class as much as possible. And later on also, we are always available on email or phone, any doubt, anytime we are there. Dr. Pratima, please start. Thank you, sir. I will start sharing my screen now. Thank you. 
sorry, I'm not able to do it in on slide. One second. क्या नहीं हो रहा प्रतिभा स्लाइड शो नहीं हो रहा यस आराम हो जाएगा डोंट वरी हो जाएगा गो एड वी कैन सी योर स्लाइड्स थैंक यू मैम तो गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन आई एम डॉक्टर प्रतिभा झा डीएनपी रेसिडेंट फर्स्ट ईयर पेलेटिव मेडिकल सेंट इन सर गंगाराम हॉस्पिटल द टॉपिक विच आई विल बी प्रेजेंटिंग टूडे इज कैंसर पेन सिंड्रोम this topic is actually quite vast and i will try to cover as many points as possible in next 40 to 45 minutes so i'll be covering cancer pain syndrome with the help of the below agenda first i will present the background and introduction to this topic following which we will deep dive into the types of pain and their detailed classification then we will see how we can make the assessment to this pain and finally we will see how we can manage it so let's start with the background and introduction so cancer pain it remains the significant clinical problem worldwide and it's the most common symptom and also the most feared in cancer patients leading to their poor quality of life despite significant advances in understanding early detection and treatment of cancer progress related to the treatment of cancer pain has been really slow or largely inadequate there has been increased awareness of uh, cancer pain as a clinical problem the development of new guidelines for the treatment and also the increased worldwide consumption of opioid has uh, really helped to reduce the burden of cancer pain but however but however the prevalence of pain still remains high so uh, let's try to understand what uh, cancer pain syndrome is it's a constellation of signs and symptoms and uh, in general term it is it is a large range of different pain condition characterized by different etiologies characteristics or pathological mechanisms the recognition of cancer pain syndrome and the ability to distinguish between them is a critical skill for a palliative care clinician since the syndrome has associated with distinct etiologies and pathologies and they have often important prognostic and therapeutic implications so due to the complexity of cancer pain syndrome classifying pain is essential also because in particular cases there is need to introduce new management strategies in order to achieve adequate pain control over time many efforts have been put in bringing together a unique standardized classification system uh, for cancer pain but uh, that can be used in both clinical practice and also in research worldwide so we, here we have broadly classified pain into acute and chronic pain so acute pain is usually accompanied by diagnostic or therapeutic intervention it is transient and self limiting and resolve within 3 months on the other hand chronic uh, pain is related to the neoplasm or to the anti neoplastic therapy it is persistent unremitting and usually lasts for more than 3 months now when we have classified the pain syndrome um, i will now go into the details of each of these pain separately starting with acute pain syndrome it most acute pain syndromes are heterogeneous that is it it is related to the diagnostic test or treatment however some are also disease related the prevention and timely management of acute pain syndrome is essential as any sort of acute pain in cancer patient it induces neural remodeling and uh, sensitization which finally may translate into chronic pain which will lead to the poor quality of life for the patients the acute pain syndrome may have serious various etiologies and broadly uh, the syndrome may be categorized based on the character of pain nature of therapy leading to uh, pain syndrome or specific tissue involvement leading to a uh, pain so depending on etiology we have classified uh, acute pain syndrome as the following first is the diagnostic part pain due to diagnostic intervention it uh, includes pain after lumbar puncture headache or there is trans uh, transrectal pr prostatic biopsy pain after mammography second is the pain after therapeutic procedures which includes cryosurgery post operative pain radiofrequency tumor ablation 
Third is pain after analgesic techniques, which includes opioid injection pain, uh, opioid headache, there's spinal injection pain, in, et cetera. Then there are pain directly related to tumor, which includes hemorrhage uh, due to tumor, there's pathological fracture, obstruction, and perforation of hollow viscera, and then superior vena cumbus syndrome, pain, or pain due to acute thrombosis. Uh, fifth, we have pain after chemotherapy, which is very common in cancer patients. It, it includes mucositis, neuropathy, bone or muscle pain. There's uh, intraperitoneal uh, pain after intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Uh, sixth is the hormonal therapy, uh, pain after hormonal therapy, which includes painful gynecomastia, pain after... Uh, in luteinizing hormones, uh, releasing factor in prostate cancer and or hormone-induced fail flare in breast cancer. Radi uh, pain after radiation therapy is also quite common, which cause mucositis or blacheal plexopathy. So I've included this uh, photograph of one of our patients who uh, presented with uh, mucositis after radiation. It was really very painful to the patient and she was not able to eat anything after that. And lastly, we have pain after immunotherapy and also pain after in infection, which include wound abscess, myalgia, or arthralgia. So I want to show this photograph of one of our patients who was having osteosarcoma and, uh, and also has underwent amputation, limb amputation. And then a few days after that, he presented with abscess at the amputated site, which was causing him uh, severe cancer pain. So uh, now we have broadly classified uh, acute pain syndrome. So now we'll uh, come to the um, uh, chronic pain syndrome. In terms of pathophysiological criteria, cancer pain can be um, divided into nociceptive or neuropathic. Nociceptive pain can be further classified into uh, visceral or somatic, depending on the level of the structure which is affected. Every cancer, every pain, caused by the lesion or the damage to the somatosensory nervous system is considered as neuropathic. Moreover, the cancer pain can often be made of mixed pathology or including both nociceptive and neuropathic component. So here are a few of the general facts which are related to the cancer pain, so chronic cancer pain syndrome, that uh, almost one quarter of the patient experience two or more types of pain. The 90% of the patient have one or more tumor-related pain. And in somatic pains are more common than the neuropathic or the visceral, uh, visceral pains. Effectively treating uh, the chronic pain poses a great challenge for the physician. This type of pain often affects person's uh, life in many ways. It can change someone's personality, ability to function, or the quality of life. So cancer pain um, may involve persistent pain or breakthrough pain. Persistent pain is continuous and may last all day. And I will uh, want to briefly discuss breakthrough pain here. Breakthrough pain is brief flare-up of severe pain uh, that occurs even uh, when the patient is taking his regular pain medication. It usually comes on quickly and may last for a few minutes to an hour. Many patients experience a number of episodes of breakthrough pain each day, and it can result from cancer treatment or may occur in uh, during any certain activities like walking or coughing. It can also occur unexpectedly without uh, proceeding in, without any incident or any clear cause. Breakthrough pain is usually um, treated with strong opioids or short-acting pain medication that works faster than persistent pain medication. A significant barrier in to better understand a chronic pain syndrome, their prevalence or their consequences is the lack of uh, consistent diagnostic criteria for specific syndrome. At present, they are classified according to the putative mechanisms, uh, that is, whether they are cancer-related, treatment-related, or unrelated to cancer, and the underlying pathophysiology, that is, if they are nociceptive, somatic, visceral, or neuropathic. So we have already discussed uh, the... Um, the types of pathophysiological cancer pain. Now we will see how we can classify cancer, chronic cancer pain syndrome depending on their causes. First is pain associated with direct tumor. Um, 
in this we have broadly classified into uh, it into nociceptive pain syndrome somatic and visceral and also neuropathic pain syndrome so let's see what we have in uh, uh, nociceptive pain syndrome in somatic category so first i will like to briefly discuss about uh, tumor related somatic pain syndrome in this we have uh, it is a persistent pain which is caused by tumor involvement of bone muscles or connective tissue and it is bone as we have as we know that bone metastasis are the most common cause of chronic pain here we it includes multifocal bone pain which is associated with metastasis and is the most co mostly common uh, commonly present in tumors of breast prostate or lung pain may be due to direct invasion or secondary pathological fracture or damage to the adjacent structure typically it is uh, the pain is focal aching or can be worsened by movement or weight bearing second is vertebral pain syndrome as we know the spine is the most common site of bone metastasis and it, the pain usually present below the site of metastasis the here we see that uh, when it the lesion affect the odontoid process it refers to the base of the neck when c7 or t1 vertebra is affected the pain is referred to the intrascapular region or when the t12 and n1 vertebra uh, l1 level is affected then it refers to the iliac crest region or the rated uh, tocantral region Next, we have pelvic and hip metastasis, which involve pubis, ilium, or sacroiliac area. Pain uh, presents as a continuous local aching or hip, or when the patient is walking, or the pain is present in the knee or the thigh. It also includes malignant piriformis syndrome, which presents as the pain in buttock or the sciatic distribution. Next, we have base of skull metastasis. These syndromes, base of these are locally extensive or metastatic ca cancer at the base of the skull. It includes following syndromes. Uh, first is the orbital syndrome, which present at retroorbital pain, proptosis, or diplopia. There is visual distortion in the patient or chemosis of the involved eye. Second, it can present as a middle cranial fossa syndrome, which uh, uh, which uh, presents as malar or jaw pain, or there is painful trigeminal neuropathy. It can also present as jugular foramen pain syndrome, and which is which uh, presents as pain in the ipsilateral neck or uh, ear or the shoulder. Then we have or occipital condyle syndrome, in which the tumor is just lateral to the foramen of magnum and presents as the unilateral occipital pain or neck stiffness. Now we will discuss the nociceptive pain syndrome in visceral category. First is the hepatic distension syndrome, which is the, the pain sensitive structure in the region of liver and which includes the liver capsule, vessels or the diaphragm or the biliary tract. The pain is usually dull, aching and that can be worsened by the positional changes. And then there is peritoneal carcinomatosis and chronic intestinal obstruction which is due to the diffuse abdominal pain or maybe distension. It is most common in ovarian cancer and colorectal cancer. Next is uh, malignant perineal syndrome, which is common in rectum or colon cancer patient or reproductive tract or distal urinary system uh, cancer. Next is the ureteric obstruction, which is caused by malignant obstruction of ureter, which is usually attributed by genital, gastrointestinal, genital urinary or gynecological cancer or may or may not be painful. Next, we have adrenal pain syndrome, which is commonly originated from uh, lung cancer and can produce unilateral flank pain or abdominal pain. Now, coming to uh, neuropathic pain syndrome, almost one in three patients, or we can say one third of the cancer patient can have neuropathic component. The clinical characteristics of neuropathic pain are different from those encountered patients of nociceptive pain or characterized by the presence of sensory alteration in terms of hypersensitivity or hyposensitivity symptoms and signs in patients with cancer. Neuropathic result from malignant infiltration of nerves or nerve damage during surgical intervention and can lead to following types of pain. First, you will see the leptomeningeal metastasis pain after leptomeningeal metastasis. It is 
most common in breast and lung cancer uh, on patient of lymphoma or leukemia. So it presents as pain, uh, which is aching or uh, pain generally in the neck region. And it is a migraine-like or tension-like headache pain and worsen, which worsen in the morning or with the well, salva maneuver techniques. Then we have cranial neuralgia, which occurs from the metastasis involving in the base of the skull or the sinuses, the leptomeninges or the soft tissue of the head and neck. These are broadly classified as glossopharyngeal neuralgia or uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Next, we have the plexopathies, which, uh, which means that injury to the nerve or specific distribution. It can be brachial, thoracic, or lumbosacral. Then we have cervical plexopathy invasion of, uh, of the cervical plexus by a locally advanced or metastatic disease. Then we have brachial plexopathy in lung cancer or breast cancer patient. Next are the radiculopathies. Uh, any malignant process that compresses, distort, or inflames nerve root may cause painful radiculopathy or polyradiculopathy. Radiculopathy. Uh, radicular pain can be continuous, it can be intermittent, or it can be sharp, or sometimes patient can have burning or electric-like feeling in radicular pain. Then there is lumbosacral flexibility, which is most common in patient of colorectal, cervical, or breast cancer patient. And last one here, I want to uh, mention about paraneoplastic painful peripheral neuropathy, which is very rare. Uh, not so common manifestation, but at uh, pain is the most common symptom with, with which the patient presents. Now coming to the pain related to the tumor therapy. Here we have a variety of uh, pain related after tumor therapy. First is the chemotherapy related pain. There can be hormone pain after hormonal therapy, radiation therapy, stem cell transplantation, uh, mediated brass buster for disease, and then after surgical pain. I will not go into detail of all of this, but I would like to mention a few. First is the radiation therapy induced chronic pain syndrome. Here we have neurological syndrome. Uh, radiation therapy can lead to cancer pain syndrome associated with injury to viscera, soft tissue, or the neuronal tissue and can induce cervical, brachial, or lumbosacral plexopathy as we have seen previously. It, uh, the clinical distinction between radiation-induced plexopathy or malignant plexopathy related to recurrent disease or secondary primary can be challenging, and we need repeated imaging to assess the pain repeatedly. Then we have lymphedema, which is most common after surgery or radiation to the breast or the shoulder or the pelvis. Approximately one third of the patients with cancer are present with lymphedema, and it is a very painful experience for the patient. Now we have completed the background introduction and the classification on pain. Now we will see the assessment, how we can assess the pain. Cancer pain assessment is a complex undertaking. The evaluation begins with the thorough history of both pain or the underlying malignancy as well as their treatment. Because of the potential impact of pain on the quality of life, it is essential to determine the adverse effect of pain on physical and psychosocial well-being, as well as the spiritual impact of pain. Cancer pain can linger, may linger after cancer is removed, for example, in post mastectomy or in post amputation or post thoracotomy syndrome patient. And this may have uh, important psychological and spiritual impact. So pain is a subjective perception and in, it is influenced by both, as I have discussed, psychological and pathological related factor. Therefore, assessment of pain is mainly based on the patient and they should be actively involved in the evaluation process. Considering that the cancer pain is often unpredictable and highly variable, an appropriate assessment is essential and should include all aspects of pain. Pain can be presenting symptom in cancer patient or might lead to the diagnosis of the disease. Very often, pain can also be a sensitive sign of cancer progression, guiding further imaging and testing and helping in cancer staging. So here uh, we have a few of the pain assessment scale. First, we have classified it into 
unidimensional and multidimensional instrument. Uh, unidimensional is a simple or valid method to assess, while multidimensional pain scales are uh, complex and these are time consuming. Uni First, we will discuss the unidimensional pain scale. It, in it includes verbal descriptive scale, there is verbal numeric rating scale, there is visual analog scale. The advantages of these scales is that the limited selection of descriptors and patient can select moderate than extreme. Uh, uh, and then it is simple or easy compressibility and sensitive to small changes of pain. Next, I want to mention, I will not go into the detail because it will be a, another uh, big topic itself. The, there are multidimensional instruments, for example, the McGill Pain Questionnaire, and then the Wisconsin Brief Pain Inventory. We have a Memorial Pain Assessment Card and the Advanced Symptoms Assessment Scale in multidimensional instrument. And in pediatric patient, we can use the Bear Orchard Scale, the Elan Scale, and then Mac Breast Face Scale, etc. Now, uh, in addition to other physical symptoms or uh, both medical and psychiatric morbidities should be characterized as they may be independent target for the therapy. The painful side should be examined in details and other physical relevant finding for the patient medical status should be noted. So here we can see how we will evaluate the uh, cancer patient with cancer pain. First, we will take the detailed oncological history. What is the stage of the disease? How is the what is the history? What are the chemotherapeutic agent which is on the outcome and the understanding of the patient, most importantly, of the disease and the progress and the process and the prognosis. Then we will take the pain history in de detailed manner. In we'll see which. Uh, for a new pain site or the pattern or the intensity of the pain, the quality of the pain and if the uh, pain interferes with any of the neural usual activity with the patient, if the current and past, the history of the current and past analgesic used by the patient or the prior analgesic use or efficacy and what were the side effects uh, of that analgesic in that patient. Then we will take a medical history, which will be kind of independent with the oncological history. Here we will see if the patient is having any coexisting comorbidities along with the cancer, if there is any allergic uh, medications or there, if he's in on any current medication or there's prior, though if he has underwent any surgeries uh, previously. Then we will take a detailed psychological history and obviously thorough medical examination is very important. So now we have completed the background introduction and assessment of pain. Now we will see how we can manage the pain. Cancer pain management is a multidimensional uh, entity and it requires an interdisciplinary approach. It requires a close interaction between various specialties like medical, uh, radiation, uh, radiational, uh, surgical oncology, anesthesiology, and pain and palliative care services, in addition to uh, interventional physician. The various pharmacological and non-pharmacological intervention for diagnostic and therapeutic purpose have associated uh, adverse effects, and pain is one of them. So uh, surprisingly, uh, the barrier of effective pain management have remained largely the same over the last few uh, decades. Uh, lack of knowledge regarding pain assessment and management among clinicians is still very common. Little time is devoted in, to pain management in medical school and later during postgraduate training. The misconception about analgesic and the nature of uh, cancer pain remain, still remain very high. There is increased survival among persons with cancer coupled with growing complexity of the disease and introduction of new treatment has ironically made the treatment of pain more challenging. The patient uh, with cancer are now exposed to too many therapies and, and over relatively long period of time. Many of these therapies have the risk, uh, carry the risk uh, to considerable side effects, which and pain is uh, very common in those side effects. And uh, despite the availability of straightforward and cost-effective therapy, cancer pain is still very under-treated in patients. 
the cause of under treatment can be multifactorial uh, that reflect the combined effect of clinician patient and system related barrier as i have uh, discussed that uh, clinician may often have inadequate uh, knowledge and skills or attitude that minimize the importance of pain management they may be reluctant to prescribe drug that due to the concern about side effect or fear of having uh, hastening death or through aggressive pain control patient may under report pain due to stoicism or concern about distracting the physician from anti neoplastic therapy in addition opioid therapy is provided uh, uh, therapeutic non hindrance or believed to be common and there is a fear of addiction and the development of side effect which is related to it so um, given the profound impact of uh, uncontrolled pain on all aspect of uh, life the prevalence of and complexity of under treatment clinician must be attend to the possibility that poorly controlled pain is uh, being under reported and it may be the result of a poor access to care uh, under prescribing or non entrance awareness of under treatment and willingness to confront these causes is usually the first step towards improving the outcome so uh, now we will see the treatment protocol for cancer pain management as i have discussed that the assessment uh, to the pain management is very much important first we will uh, we will in detail we will assess the type of pain or uh, to the patient and then if the patient is having no pain then well and good and if the patient is having pain which is unrelated to the cancer then we will treat according to the source of pain then if the pain is uh, is the if the, there is cancer pain then we will initiate the analgesic ladder which i will discuss in the uh, um, upcoming slide then but then again we will do the reassessment and again and again and uh, if we see the if the pain persists then we will see other uh, consider other etiological and treatment uh, which are available so these are the strategies which uh, are uh, required to attack cancer pain uh, first is eliminating the or modifying the source of pain in this we have surgery radiotherapy chemo or hormonal therapy second we can do uh, we can alter the central pain's perception by a pharmacological analgesic there is psycho by psychosocial support or relaxation technique and thirdly we can block the transmission of the pain to the central nervous system which include local anesthetic blockade there is neurosurgical techniques and regional regional infusion of drug in epidural or intrathecal sites so these are the following cancer pain management option options now and first is the anti neoplastic treatment which include pharmacological management like uh, nsaids there's opioid or adjuvant analgesics and then there's interventional pain management uh, option which uh, in which there is con uh, continuous parenteral infusion of opioids there is uh, neurexil analgesia there is nerve blocks or spinal cord stimulation then apart from that there are also behavioral pain management techniques or home or hospice based treatment so this is the who analgesic ladder uh, which is uh, which provides a strategy to control uh, pain so here i have included included the revised uh, who ladder which includes the fourth step which is the invasive and minimally invasive treatments so it is a uh, first it was a three step approach for in first step we prescribe the non opioids or the adjuvant therapy which is for mild uh, for the mild pain patients and then second is the moderate uh, pain in the mild to moderate pain category here we start the opioid and along with that we give the non opioid plus the adjuvant treatments in third in third step 3 we provide the opioid for moderate to severe pain and then plus along with that non opioid and uh, adjuvant therapies is given and then there is fourth step which is invasive and minimally invasive treatments which we will discuss later so these this is the bidirectional approach of uh, who now coming uh, to the pain pathway or the management so 
I will briefly uh, discuss a little bit about the pain pathway here. I will not go into the detail of it. As you know that uh, it in, uh, involves four important mechanisms which is involved in nociceptive pain. First is the transduction, then transmission, perception, and modulation. The first step of pathophysiology of pain is the transduction. It begins from the free nerve ending and of primary of primary efferent neuron and which responds to the nauseous stimuli. The several pain mechanisms activate the nociceptor uh, directly activating the specific ion channel on the terminal and inflammatory molecules are released on the damaged tissue which activate the uh, which increase the vascular permeability and causes pain. Then we have the uh, transmission that occurs whereby the pain is impulses transmitted from the transduction site to the dorsal hall of spinal cord, from the spinal cord to the brain stem, and finally through the connection between thalamus cortex or higher center of the brain. The A delta fiber and C fiber play a role in the process of transmission. The A delta fibers are fast conducting fibers and are responsible for the immediate uh, sharp pain, whereas C fibers are small and respons responsible for transmitting dull aching or constant pain. Then we have the uh, pathway of pain modulation and then the perception of pain. Approximately one third of the patient do not uh, receive analgesia proportional to their pain in, um, intensity. A mechanism-based approach in pain therapy is essential for providing a more individualized and effective analgesia, but in order to apply such approach, it is important to recognize and classify the underlying pathological uh, processes. So here we can see that the NSAIDs, it uh, mainly works on the transduction um, site and opioids, as we can see, it uh, works in all the levels, that is perception, mo modulation, transmission, and transduction of pain. So now when we have seen the multimodal mechanism, let's briefly discuss about each of uh, these uh, pain management uh, um, medication. First is non-opioid analgesic, which includes acetaminophen, there's NSAIDs, um, in acetaminophen is the equipotent to aspirin and it, is, it doesn't have uh, anti-inflammatory or anti platelet action. Then we have NSAIDs, which uh, is a cyclooxygenase inhibitor, which um, inhibits prostaglandin degradation and then it decreases pain by reducing the sensitivity of the pain and also reduces the inflammatory process and causes, uh, which causes edema. Then in this, we have COX-1 and COX-2 in inhibitor. It can be selective or non-selective. The COX-2 inhibitor has selectively uh, reduced risk of GI toxicity or reduced antiplatelet effect, then which is caused by COX-1 inhibitors. This is the table of uh, non-opioid analgesic, the dosing schedule or the maximum doses which we can give uh, to the cancer patient. Now, uh, I will discuss briefly about the opioids. Uh, it is a widely used treatment for cancer-related pain because of their safety, multiple routes of administration, ease of titration, reliability, and effectiveness for all type of pain. It is the first line for moderate to severe uh, pain. It uh, acts by binding to specific receptor. Um, uh, in, uh, there are three respective receptors at which opioids bind first the mu, kappa, and delta receptor. We have uh, opioid working on step two and step three. Step two opioids are, uh, we consider it as mild uh, intensity opioids in which there's codeine, oxycodone, there's tramadol or hydrocodone. Step, in step three, there's strong opioids in which there's uh, morphine or fentanyl, which we use commonly in our practice. So this is the table which uh, which I have included about the doses, uh, the oral preparation or parenteral preparation which can be used and the duration of the effect which it has or the side effect um, which it has. Coming to the side effects of opioids, uh, it can cause constipation as we know is the most common um, side effects of opioids. Some patients may have nausea, vomiting, urinary retention, there's itch, rash, respiratory depression, drug interaction, neurotoxicity, or there is myoclonic seizure, which, have, which we should be taken into consideration and treated accordingly. 
Now, <laughs> I will briefly discuss about opioid rotation. Uh, it's an approach to convert poorly responsive patient to a responsive one. There are a few guidelines according to which we do opioid rotation. First, we use equivalent analgesic table to calculate the dose of the new opioid, roughly equivalent to the dose of the current opioid. Then we determine the clinically relevant starting point. If we are switching uh, to any opioid other than methadone or pantolin, we decrease the equinalgesic dose by 20 to 25 to 50%. If we are switching to methadone, we reduce the dose by 75 to 90%. So, and if we are switching to transdermal fentanyl, we don't uh, need to reduce the equinalgesic dose. We, uh, then we consider the forward dose adjustment based on the medical condition and also the pain. If the patient is elderly or has significant organ failure, we consider further dose reduction. If the patient has severe pain, we consider a lesser dose reduction. Then we give, also give the rescue dose as 5 to 15 percent of the total daily opioid dose and we administer at an appropriate interval. And of, and of course, reassessment and titration of the new opioid is always required. Then uh, there's a little bit about the adjuvant analgesic. These uh, are the drugs which are not primarily of pain relief, but it has a combination with an analgesic that can control, enhance pain control. Over the past uh, three decades, the number and types of these non-traditional analgesics have increased dramatically. Some are now commonly used as a single entity for chronic pain also. So it includes uh, antidepressant, anticonvulsant, and uh, there's corticosteroid, lidocaine, or this phosphonate, there's NMDA antagonist, which uh, can be used in different types of pain, like neuropathic, uh, there's osteolytic bone pain, or and when there's tolerance to opioids. Uh, now, I would like to briefly mention about few of the special pain uh, syndrome. As we have discussed through pain previously, and we have uh, that it requires strong opioids and immediate release formulation because of, and also the opioids which have rapid onset of time and most direct to. Morphine is generally preferred for the breakthrough pain treatment. Next, the analgesic for the neuropathic pain. Uh, there are two uh, approaches. First is the pharmacological and next is the non-pharmacological. In pharmacological, we have tricyclic antidepressant, anticonvulsant, there's gabapin, gaba, uh, carbazepine, pregabalin. And we can also use local anesthetic like in parenteral, oral, or topical form. Uh, opioids are used, steroids are used, and then NMDA receptor agonists are used according to the um, uh, symptom patient present. Then there is non-pharmacological treatment like radiation treatment, there is anesthetic treatment, nerve block or epidural block. Next, if the bone pain, analgesics and bone pain, uh, here we can see there is pharmacological radiation treatment or surgical treatment. We can prescribe opioids, there are uh, NSAIDs, uh, steroids or COX inhibitors, and then there is bisphosphonate uh, like zolentronate or palindronate. Then radiation treatment is provided, which has a maximal effect for four to six weeks, and it provides an immediate relief and uh, in 60 to 80 percent of the patient. And then there is surgical uh, approach in like uh, in um, like intramedullary support or vertebral uh, reconstruction. So. When the pharmacological therapy fails to provide adequate analgesia or to lead and it leads to an acceptable side effect, we can consider interventional techniques for pain management. So uh, first I will discuss about intravenous infusion of opioids with patient controlled analgesia, which we call TCA. It is indicated when the patient is having severe pain and when they need to titrate opioid rapidly. Oral and when the oral route is not available because of gastrointestinal obstruction, there's malabsorption or uncontrolled nausea and vomiting in the patient. Next, there is intraspinal analgesia, which is used when uh, systemic opioids uh, pain relief, but unacceptable side effects are there. There is unsuccessful treatment with strong opioids, and but we have to make sure that the life expectancy of the patient is more than three months or two to six months. And morphine is the gold standard in this therapy. 
Next, we have neurolytic blocks in which there is somatic or sensory blocks, and then there the are sympathetic flex sympathetic flexors block in which there is ciliate ganglion block, which can be given for a upper limb tumor. There is celiac flexor block, which can be used in patient of carcinoma liver, uh, pancreas, and stomach. There is lumbar flexor block for the patient of carcinoma of uh, lower limb or pelvis. We can also give superior hypogastric block for the pelvis and uh, pelvis cancer of, and cancer of the cervix. Then there is ganglior impulse for CA rectum. But there are few limitations which is involved with these interventional uh, techniques. First, is the, the new pain pathway develops, which uh, and then the pain relief is not 100%. It may provide 60 to 70% of the pain relief. The duration with which it lasts is three to four months, and there is morbidity related to the procedure, which we have to take into consideration. Along with uh, all the um, pharmacological treatment or interventional treatment, we will also see if um, the cancer treatment also reduces pain by shrinking the tumor and by reducing the pressure on the nerves or the surrounding tissue. When the cancer treatment is given with an aim of reducing or getting rid of the symptoms rather than curing the cancer, it is we call it palliative treatment. So there are various ways in which we can give palliative treatment to the patient. Um, the first is the chemotherapy, the palliative chemotherapy, there's palliative radiotherapy, there's hormonal therapy, biological or radiofrequency ablation. Uh, radiation therapy in cancer pain it is used uh, is used when the X-ray uh, to destroy the cancer cell. It damages the genetic material of the cell in that area. The normal cell usually grows, and the cancer cell um, much better than the cancer cell, and the cancer cell cannot. Then we have uh, chemotherapy in the biological. These are the biological therapy which can shrink many can type of cancer to reduce the symptom uh, and the pain. The hormone treatment can also shrink the sometimes of pain, uh, such as breast. It can be given in breast cancer, prostate cancer, or kidney cancer. Then there is radiofrequency ablation, and lastly there there is surgery. So in surgery we call it uh, debulking surgery. A surgeon uh, can carry out operation and can take away as much tumor as possible. It can relieve pain by relieving the pressure, and it may also prevent the complication uh, of developing a blockade, blockade due to the blockade of bowel due to the tumor. So along with all the procedure, medical, interventional, and the uh, uh, palliative um, therapies, there are few non-medical treatment for the pain which I will uh, like to discuss briefly. Uh, it is now widely used to help the manage pain, cancer pain along with the pharmacological treatment. Uh, many techniques are used along with pain medication, though they can also be used. Uh, they can or be used alone for uh, can be used alone for the mild pain or discomfort. People can may find uh, that they can be little. Um, I will say uh, 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 some people find that they can take lower dose of pain medication when they have they use uh, non medical treatment. There are certain treatments which we can include in these uh, categories. First is the relaxation technique. There can be imaginary technique, distraction, hypnosis. There can be sting stimulation or uh, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. There's acupuncture, exercises or physical therapy. And also emotional support and counseling of the patient is also very important. So here I will conclude my slide. And if uh, for the cancer pain syndrome, and if there is any question, uh, thank you, thank you, everyone. So thank, thank you, Pratibha. Mitlesh, please go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Mitlesh. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Pratibha, uh, it was a wonderful lecture, and you have covered almost uh, uh, everything. Uh, for students, uh, don't be uh, afraid by these fancy names and uh, so many syndromes and so many things, new things, different things. The basic approach of pain is always the same. Uh, we get 
calls from our residents and fellows who are working in other parts of India that, sir, I have got a patient of uh, prostate pain. I don't know what block I have to give. Sir, I have got a patient of back pain referred from uh, uh, author's mind. If they are not doing anything, what I can do? First of all, learn how to assess the pain. It's a basic approach. We almost all in this group, there are so many lectures on this. Approach is always the same. Make yourself understand that you are the one who is going to treat this. Once you understand what is the expectation of the patient, a practical approach, don't ever target that the pain will be zero. What is the requirement of the patient? An elderly woman who's having pain in knee just for by climbing stairs and she can avoid climbing stairs. So your treatment ends if you do that modification. A patient who is having coccidinia, tailbone pain, you just do some modification in the sitting chair and that's it. So what is the expectation of the patient? What patient expect from us? The concept of total pain in palliative care is beautiful. Other than uh, departments, uh, suppose a pain uh, of, uh, like uh, we have given example of back pain uh, that a patient was referred from orthospine that we are not going to operate upon this. There is metastasis, there is fusion. Or long term, there is a, a, a already a irreversible damage happened. So I'm not going to operate. It is not going to help. We have tried as you know. Okay, now the uh, our part starts. We understand how much it is affecting the patient. What is the severity? What is the status of the kidney of the patient? What is the status of liver? What is the? We don't have any upper limit. Starting from paracetamol, you can go up to spinal cord stimulation. Understanding the patient, treating it as a holistic approach, making small steps daily, get the confidence of the patient, whether a patient of a spinal cord uh, 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 compression, brachial plexopathy, don't feel that I have not seen this patient before. I will refer it to someone who knows. No, you will learn daily. Just see how much is the pain score. Start. Never. Uh, we get frequent uh, calls from the patient uh, that doctor has started, but uh, a drug therapy failed. Uh, the, he has done some intervention. It has failed. Nothing fails. We learn daily. I have started on paracetamol today. I will see the status of the patient. I will go to the maximum dose. Then I will wait and see whether it is effective or not. A patient is much more comfortable on tablet morphine. Sushma ma'am always tells that it is the drug in most of the uh, severe pain round the clock, by the mouth, take uh, a decision. There is no upper limit of these drugs. It is there to treat your pain and uh, uh, you can go. Huh? Monitoring is different. You have to see what other drugs patient is taking. Is it on movement? Do you need some breakthrough pain background? Do you need some other NSID? Do you need vitorococcyl? That is assessment, management <coughs> goes hand by hand. Do not be afraid of all these pain syndromes and these fancy names. You have to treat the patient as much as you can. Take help of your seniors, take help of other department, ask radiotherapy people whether you are giving radiotherapy will help in this or not. A patient is referred from radiotherapy, patient of bone pain. There was pain after giving bisphosphonate. Now is asking what to do. I have been told that this drug will reduce my pain and I'm getting pain after receiving this drug. In that scenario, you have to sit with the patient, discuss with patient that yes, it is an acceptable modality. It is there, but I am there to treat it. 
I will assess what is your requirement. We have so many other drugs. We are just to classify drug, whether it is acute, whether it is chronic, whether it is somatic, whether it is nociceptive, whether it is neuropathic. Once you have made the diagnosis and understand the requirement of the patient, you almost everybody in this group know how to manage. And uh, uh, I will uh, uh, stop here and I will ask anybody and everybody to ask something regarding this topic. We have uh, our uh, guide, uh, Dr. Shushma Ma'am is also there. We are privileged. So discuss as much as possible. Please go ahead. So any resident want to ask anything? Because we have five minutes. Any question, any resident or DNB or MDs, uh, please open your mic and say. Mitlesh, I'm so happy to see both of you. And Dr. Mitlesh, I have, I, I, I'm so happy that you have given enough importance to assessment of pain and assessment on daily basis because chronic pain syndrome is, the, is a patient with chronic pain syndrome is a patient who will need assessment on daily basis. So if a patient is admitted in, in your ward and uh, uh, most of the time you are finding that patient is not uh, uh, getting relieved, I think assessment on daily basis will make a huge difference. Plus uh, giving the realistic hope of uh, whatever treatment you are giving, uh, whatever uh, intervention you are doing, uh, giving a realistic hope of all this treatment and intervention, I think it will make a huge difference. So uh, again, I'm very happy that you you all have learned so well about the total pain management. I think we sh it, it is so important to learn. Otherwise, uh, people keep trying some of the other medications, some of the other intervention without talking to patient and without assessing the uh, in depth. So I think you have given enough importance to this. And this is the most important thing in cancer pain syndrome. You know, theory we can learn, everybody can learn that what type of various cancer pain syndrome, but when it comes to ultimately, we have to relieve the patient. And it is, it, it has been seen consistently. And I think there are mo most of the senior people are here and they can share their experience that when we assess properly, when we talk to the patient properly, uh, it make a huge, it, it really makes a huge difference. So anybody wants to say anything, Nandani, um, I can see Vidya, Shobha, Dr. Nagesh. Dr. Nagesh has written a beautiful comment for Pratiba for you. Dr. Nagesh, if you know that he, is, he was the past president and very senior palliative care physician and he has written wonderful and God bless you. I think I'm so happy. And you, uh, Arjuna, you should send these all these comments to Pratiba so that she's a young first year DNB student and so many comments for her on her lecture. Sure. So anybody wants to say anything? Shobha, Sushma, yes. Can I... yeah, Sushma. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, congratulations to Dr. Pradipa uh, for her first presentation, which went really well. Uh, just a couple of comments. I think uh, this probably have been mentioned in the slides about uh, sympathetically maintained pain, um, in, especially in Pankos tumor. And uh, so you can give uh, IV lidocaine or lignocaine um, uh, in the ward, uh, mm -hmm. maybe a ketamine infusion and things like that. So that was probably mentioned. And there was also another typo, Dr. Pradipa, about mm -hmm. alpha-2 agonist, and yet uh, probably written it as antagonist. So alpha-2 agonist, the example is clonidine, which is very useful for, uh, again, different kinds of pain. Um, so uh, just look at the typo. Maybe you can correct that before you send it to everyone. Uh, okay. These are the comments that I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you, Shobha. Vidya has already written uh, Pratiba. Very nice overview on this presentation. Very good. Uh, anyone else? Nandini, uh, Dr. Rajshri. No. The Pratiba no. spoke very confidently, and that is really nice to you know, hear the tone of her voice. She was in, you know, control of what she was uh, presenting. That was, that's very good for a junior resident. I was very impressed with the way she presented. And um, I don't know whether we can have more focused discussion in the further classes about specific pain syndromes or symptom clusters, you know, one with the other. So 
you can consider that sushma thank you yes this is this is a very important point highlighted nandini this is there because i know this cancer pain syndrome is such a big topic it's like a book so we can write a book on cancer pain syndrome and we have given it to pratibha the most junior person but i think she has done very well and there are there are topics on the specific uh, cancer pain syndromes on individual basis yes so pratibha dr nandini is uh, <clears throat> senior uh, consultant head of the department of palliative medicine at st john hospital hospital and shobha uh, is head of the department of palliative medicine at uh, amruta institute of cochin so just for your introduction so all uh, senior people uh, are commenting on your slides so well done thank you and it's it's 7:30 so uh, if there are no questions and comments i think uh, we should stop because we have to go for our work also so uh, thank you very much pratibha and uh, mitlesh both thank, thank you, you ma'am thank you so much and uh, thank you arjuna and nisha my right and left hands so uh, they are they are the one those who are coordinating everything and keeping track of all the time and uh, arjuna start sending me messages from friday that you have a we have a lecture on monday so uh, okay. i think they are the one those who are keeping everything on track and uh, thank you audience for joining and it is so much of encouragement it's almost 80 people have joined pratibha in the morning now see 30 people have left because they have to go for job work and even I, we have to go okay thank you very much ha huh? see you next week dr nagesh good morning uh, you want to say last one minute last nothing, one nothing. second i am very happy with uh, youngsters doing this and uh, good luck to all of them Okay. And it's equally important that the mentors like Mithilesh are there, uh, you know, because uh, they are the future of palliative care in India. So, oh, it's a very, very bright happy. future. Yeah, it's Thank a very you, bright future. Five years ke baad, all residents will have a first choice palliative medicine in neat PG. Okay. Thank you very much. See you next week before six thirty. Please join Thank before six thirty. Thank you.